Welcome to the Retail Summit. My name is Joel Goldstein, and with me, I have Anthony Blatherwick. He is a retail expert based out of the UK. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to uh, great to meet you, Joel, and um, thanks for uh, inviting me. So, because retail is changing so much, I think the best place for us to start that conversation is really with the crux of what's going on today, which is the online offline kind of conversion. So, when a product is coming into the market right now, does it make sense to start offline and move online or to start maybe online and move into stores? <laughs> That's a very good question. And uh, I think as ever with these things, the answer is going to be it all depends. <laughs> uh, and a lot of it depends on where it's starting from and, uh, and how it's um, what type of product it is, what's the nature of the product. Um, I think what what is exciting to me is that the online market, the online world, has actually opened the opportunity for new brands, smaller innovative brands, to actually be able to get market share much more easily than they could in the past. If you if you look historically, where retailers ruled the world and uh, the retail buyers were the guys who chose what products were going to win and what products were going to lose then it was very difficult for a new, innovative, different type of product to actually gain shelf space. Um, and so startups were actually quite tough. Startups today can come from anywhere. You can go online with no capital whatsoever, I mean, a few pounds and you're online. Um, and you can actually create a demand that the buyers may never have seen. So I think there's a lot of excitement in the in all sectors, and this is this is everything from food right the way through to electronics and fashion and uh, household goods. That is actually point, yeah. creating a much more dynamic environment than maybe we've had in the past. Yeah, and because before you had to pay to get on the shelf, you know, and a lot of the smaller brands they couldn't afford even a regional grocery store for the slotting fees. So Absolutely. It, that's a very good point. And as far as bringing that new product into the market and you know creating that interest, how do you create the interest with the buyers? Where as maybe it may resonate really well with customers online and you may develop a following, how do you convey that interest in your success to a retail store buyer? Sure. I, um, again, I think we're we're looking at the new technology. If you um, and new, I mean, new is a relative term these days. I'm a very old man, so new to me is uh, is anything in the last thirty years. Um, but you know, if if you look at um, social media, social media now has created an immediacy where again people can create a a, a demand, a, an ecosystem around the noise um, that you could never do before. Um, historically, it was quite difficult. As you say, people used to have to pay for shelf space. The retailers dictated how much space something got or whether it even got shelf space at all. Um, and it was very difficult for new brands and new innovations to get onto the market. Today, you, you can actually, via social media, you can create a lot of noise without actually ever selling anything, frankly. And, right. and that, that creates some tremendous opportunities in that people can um, start to be much more innovative. They can do things in a small way that then eventually becomes a big way. Um, but it does also create a lot of problems in terms of for the retailer, because there is a massive plethora now of new brands, new items, new things coming onto the market that frankly won't fit in a retail environment. They just do not you know, no retailer has got enough space to put all this stuff. There's just too many um, options, yeah. Yeah, there are. There, there's just too many options. And and so you're now getting to a point where retailers have to be selective. Um, and it's forcing the retailers to be much more creative themselves in terms of what are they trying to offer the customer? What are they trying to build which differentiates themselves from all this stuff that's going online right. that is very easy for customers to buy? Um, so, you know, convenience is not there anymore. It's, you don't go to a shop now to be convenient. It's much easier to have it delivered. Um, so you, you're now in a space where retailers are having to be more creative, more innovative themselves to try and say, how do I create my space? How do I make my uh, retail environment different, enjoyable? 
and and it's coming to theater it, it comes to i've got to make it enjoyable i've got to make it exciting to get people to want to come to me right now, that, that's an interesting point that you, you mentioned theater you know you go to the theater to be entertained but also to really kind of get that experience of going to that environment and that's what you're saying is the retailer has to create that experience that environment that makes them makes the consumer want to come in absolutely and and if you look at some of the retailers that are really pushing the boundaries on this um we've got one retailer in new york who now is employing out of work actors on their shop floor um and the out of work actors on the shop floor, i say out of work i mean they're, they're just resting actors i suppose it'd be politically correct <laughs> Uh, so, you know, they're, they're wrestling actors, but they, they've got characters. They can create characters and they're, they're engaging with the customers, not as a sales rep, but just as someone who can create some atmosphere theater that engages the customer that then they can hand off to a salesperson to start to understand what they want and how they want to sell it. So that experience is really very, very important. We've got retailers now who are opening who, frankly, don't have any inventory to sell in store. The store is nothing more than a, a physical catalog that people can go and feel and touch and, and then have it delivered home. That I was went to one of those stores in uh, San Francisco. I thought that was really interesting. It's cool, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's, you, it's, you got to I'm try doing. all those products that you can only really see online. And you can only, you can't touch and feel them because you're not going to pay twenty five hundred dollars for a coffee table, a smart coffee table, you know, to try it out. So. Absolutely, absolutely, and that, and I think that's where you know this this dynamic that moved very quickly to online is now coming much more back to this balanced view that says, well, hang on, you do need online and retail to be able to genuinely try and create that experience that people are wanting. So, you know, the, the retailers, the traditional bricks and mortar retailers have got now a bit more of an advantage because it's tending to come back to them in terms of they've got the locations, they've got the ability to do what we call click and collect, what you guys call BOPIS, um, buy online, pick up in store. They, they've got the outlets to be able to deliver that. They've also got the ability to offer the, the trial and the touch and feel and that side of it. How far will showroom stores go? It's not for everybody. You know, it's, it's not going to be in every sector, but certainly it's, it's very effective in some areas. It's great um, for urban centers. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that is creating more of this sort of theater. It's creating more of the enjoyment. Now, if you look at how many retailers have put coffee shops or restaurants into their stores now, it's to make it a destination. Um, and people have to create some form of reason to pull people to that store. And if it can become a destination that's an enjoyable place to go, then obviously, you know, you, you then start to build that customer loyalty. Now, the key is then when you get the customer there, you've got to engage with them and make that work. Because if they come and it's boring and it's just an old retail outlet, then actually you're probably not going to go back. You'll find somewhere more interesting and exciting. So it, it's beholden on retailers to really make the most out of when they get that customer in there and make the most of that experience. And similarly for the online retailers who maybe open a few of these stores, mm -hmm. um, then they're doing the same thing. They're, they're trying to look at saying, how do I engage that customer online and in store and really add value by having that in-store piece. That's now, if you look at a Nike store, Nike stores are great fun. They're, they're, they're really vibrant yeah. places. Apple stores, great fun. They're not retailers. They really aren't retailers, but they are, they're becoming and changing the, the view of how retail really needs to look and feel. I think Apple really led the way with that, you know, store for the pure sense of to be able to touch and feel it. Um, yeah. because you could buy it online when they started out, you know, but people, they wanted to experience that and they wanted to get that hands on, you know, one-on-one right. -on -one connection. And, and you know, the, the thing that Apple were really, really smart about was the service they gave in store with their, what they call geek squad or whatever it is. Yep. The service they gave in store wowed people. 
It was way better service than they'd ever seen before. Uh, and Apple then actually gave the credibility back up to the online stores by doing that because people trusted them. The, the trust in Apple shot through the roof because of the way that they handled that when people went in store. It's a very smart move. Really smart. I totally agree. And we're also seeing that as far as in the United States with our malls. You know, a lot of our um, older malls that can't keep the Sears and the, you know, Nordstrom's in the mall, they're not the destinations that they used to be. So new places are coming in. They're becoming entertainment centers. They're becoming yes. family entertainment centers. And they're keeping 50% retail, but they're making the mall a destination for somebody to go to to get that experience. So. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, that, that the mall operators, as you say, need to be doing that because otherwise they're going to have empty units and that's expensive for them. So they, they need to create that flow through of traffic into the mall. Uh, and again, it comes back to that entertainment, that destination, doesn't it? Um, and that mix that says you don't really have too many pure retail malls now. They tend to have restaurants they to hand out, maybe cinemas, they'll have all sorts of different things going on. Um, and it, it becomes a, a destination, it becomes an outing for the family. Um, and that's where, now it's an interesting one you talk about some of these big department stores, because department stores have actually been the ones hardest hit by online retail, because department stores to try and have a, a reason for being has become much, much more difficult. Um, because to try and be all things to all men and, and have everything under one roof is difficult to try and create that that real brand. Now, there are some who've done it very well. Some some department store retailers have done a very, very good job of that. Um, take Harrods in the UK. Harrods is a true destination. They set themselves apart from everybody they else. They went with that experience. Um, and they went therefore, with that class experience. They, they, yeah. <laughs> So department stores are taking that rapid change, and we're seeing that you know, coast to coast. Um, I don't know about there in England, but you said Harrods is doing well. We have a few different stores here that are kind of weathering the storm. But how can an independent retailer compete by giving that theater and bringing that experience to a consumer, um, you know, compete with online convenience? Yeah. I, I think this is where technology starts to play a part um, in the really the, the, the retailers need to use the data they have. Uh, we've always said for years and years and years, retailers have masses of data and no information. Um, now, with AI coming in, with processing power of computers, suddenly that data can really start to give them information. They can start to know their customers quite intimately, really get to know them, really get to understand them. And, you know, as I'm sure you find, there is nothing better than you walk in a store and somebody says, oh, hi, Joel, um, how are you? What was the, whatever the item you bought last week was like? How was that for you? Did it work? Now, all of those things make a massive difference in terms of how that you're, you react to that retailer. Um, but also, if we take it up a level um, and you just think about how people, how retailers can use that sort of information, um, A, we can know what customers are wanting to buy at what time of the day. <coughs> what are their particular preferences for um, particular items they want by store, by different location, by areas? How do, how do people really shop? What are the items do they put together? So. Retailers can now start to really understand those retailers and uh, sorry, their, their customer base. Now, what's happened is the online retailers sort of grabbed hold of that because they had that knowledge um, very quickly. They knew where customers were looking on their on their site so they could say, well, OK, you looked at this similar customers, this this old thing of uh, Customers who bought that also looked at this, that, and the other. Um, you know, the, uh, there's lots of cartoons that, that show retailers trying to do the same thing, and it's uh, very funny. But actually, retailers do have that great opportunity to say, in certain stores, in certain areas, you can actually group these things together. Good retailers know how to do this. They've always known how to do it. 
But now the data they've got, this massive wealth of information now that they can really make sense of and, and understand trends and understand and react to things far more quickly than they ever could in the past mm. means that they can get that sort of thing right. Now, if you, if you look at retail and online, um, retailers still have a significantly better availability than online retail. Online retail is, on average, about 10% worse in availability to brick and mortar retailers. Really? Um, yeah. Um, and that, that's, that's research that's been done that, that shows that it's somewhere in that region. It may be a bit less, maybe a bit higher in certain sectors. But on average, um, retailer, brick and mortar retailers do have a better availability than online retailers. Now, that in itself and that ability to therefore service the customer better is something they've got to make the most of. They've got to really make sure that they do that well. And using technology, uh, again, I come back to computing power. If you go yeah. back, um, when I first started in this industry, computing power was not that great. And therefore, to create a forecast for a week for a mm. few items, actually a tough thing. Today, we can do forecasts for every item in a massive store by hour, by almost by the minute, but by hour. Um, and you can get that very, very accurate. You can then manage your supply chain to make sure that you are very efficient in the way that you supply that down into the retailer. Um, and so, yeah, the retailer can start to really compete. Now, that that is not saying on re online retailers can't do that. Of course they can. Um, the problem is a lot of on online retailers actually see themselves as technology businesses. So they, they right. don't always appreciate that there is this um, massive doing good retail business that they also have to think about because they think that they think their technology business is not retailers. They're not. Um, and I think that's become very evident with some of the early adopters who've tried to move from online, pure online retailers have gone into brick and mortar retail and found it really tough, really tough, because they haven't understood the basics of how to run a retail operation. Um, that's something that you know, traditional retailers understand, they get that. Um, now, can they transform themselves to become an online retailer? It's different again. They've got a whole new set of skills and disciplines to learn. Um, but that's an interesting two way flow. It's not all going one way. It's going in both directions. And I think that's what makes retailers so exciting. It's always been exciting because it changes all the time. It's right. very dynamic. And, you know, we, we've seen how Walmart purchased Jet.com and they've tried to compete with Amazon at their own level. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's really hard once a company gets so far ahead for, you know, an established business to catch up. But what do you see as far as online businesses, maybe starting something small, like a pop-up shop or you know, a partnership? Have you, have you seen sure. any of those kind of uh, transitions succeed? Is that a good option for somebody to look into? Yeah, I think I think one of the things that we we are seeing is, as you say, pop up shops. There, there was um, something I uh, I read only today. I think it was um, where they were talking about uh, very much female uh, orientated pop up shops um, are very much. Yeah. So so now that that's something that is uh, is really very much a coming trend. I think seasonal pop up shops are definitely something that we will see more and more of because it gives the opportunity for that trial we were talking about earlier. You don't have to have a, a full 360 day a year retail environment to be able to get people to try something. Um, if you bring a new brand online, then you could do pop-up shots just to get things going, to get the trial, to get people to see it and understand it uh, and be able to touch and feel it, that then can build that brand and then ultimately, yes, you may then move into some retail outlets. But now the world is for, it's moving faster and faster, isn't it? Um, you know, everybody's doing trying to to do things in a, a more efficient, faster way. 
So I think things like pop-up shops, yeah, we'll see more of them. Um, I think what we're going to start seeing is almost within a mall, you'll see um, centers of in the mall where there are all these pop-ups coming and they're, they're just effectively online markets, aren't they? They're, they're, they're almost like the old traditional market that was only there for it's one day. It's kind of funny how it's going back that way, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, there is nothing that is not cyclical in retail. Um, I was laughing with someone only the other day. When, uh, when I was a seven-year-old boy, I used to, my mother owned a corner shop, and I used to do deliveries on my bicycle to people, and I did the first home deliveries. And I, I mean... Home delivery is nothing new. We, we used to do it a long time ago. Um, and so, you know, everything is cyclical. We're, we're going to go back through those sort of things. And, and these markets, I think, will happen. They, um, they'll make town centers come alive again. Because um, if you think about it, going back 20 years, the, the big out-of-town hypermarkets tended to kill the small local uh, community, community centers. These markets are starting to re-enliven those community centers. They're, they're starting to bring them alive again. Um, and that's, that's changing that dynamic. The, the big out-of-town retailers now are the ones actually who've got a bit of a problem. If you look at Walmart, you, you mentioned Walmart a few minutes ago. Uh, Walmart, I think, are now doing a fantastic job in really fighting back at Amazon. I think they, they really got back together. Um, and Amazon are, you know, they're not going to have it all their own way going forward. Walmart and a number of others are now, they're understanding this. They're, they're knowing how to do it and they're knowing how to come back. Now, if you look at some of those Walmart stores, which are now, frankly, too big for what they need, they're turning them into local fulfillment centers. Um, so you've got half a retail store and half a local fulfillment center. What a sensible thing to do. It, you know, you, you've got the locality. So you're now not having the stem mileage that Amazon have because you've already got a local facility. So you're reducing your stem mileage, reducing your cost of delivery, reducing your cost of operation and still being able to offer next day delivery or same day delivery because you're right. local. So the actual economic dynamics start to move back again, and it's flowing back and forth in terms of where, who has the power. Um, and ultimately, retail is going to continue to, to evolve in that way. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more change over the, the coming year where more and more retailers are going to understand that, and they, they will start to hit back. The bit that I think is still a little bit for debate and a little bit that where are things going is the brand relationship with retailers. Now we talked about Nike. Nike used to have a very big distribution, retail distribution network. They used to have retailers all over the world. Nike have actually just reduced massively that retail distribution network because they're doing more control. They, they, they say they're trying to control their brand, but they're doing more online and they're controlling that distribution network more closely. A lot of other fairly large, well, very large manufacturers with brands, brand ownership, are now going online. Now, how does that impact the relationship with major retailers who stock those brands? I think he's something that, to me, is going to be a fascinating evolution next year, or the next year or two years, because I can't see retailers supporting brands who are effectively competing. Yeah. Um, now, I'm sure the manufacturers will say, well, hang on, retailers created their own, own brands many years ago, and it competed with the manufacturers, um, and therefore, maybe the dynamics just changing slightly the other way. Um, and so are we going to see more retail brands uh, becoming stronger as well and then the brands becoming their own outlets? I think there's, there's a lot of things going to happen and it, it's going to be exciting over the next year to see that. You mentioned Nike. I noticed that uh, I think a couple months ago they started doing a direct-to-consumer uh, exclusive release via social media only. So, yes. you know, they cut out retailers completely, only offered one SKU for a limited time, limited uh, you know, yeah. options. So you know, it's a very interesting dynamic to try to, they're fighting against the hand that feeds them, 
but it's changing as and they're trying to stay relevant as it grows. Yeah, and becomes you know it becomes a very fashion orientated environment, doesn't it? Because you you are driving a fashion, you know, get in there fast. It's not going to be there forever, and and you know you can't do that in the old traditional way because the supply chain wouldn't allow you to fill a supply chain and then empty it that quickly. Um, you know the 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 old premise of when it's gone, it's gone is absolutely what they're working on. Make it exclusive. There's only so many to go, and and therefore buy quickly, um, and that creates its own demand very rapidly. Yeah. As you as you mentioned, people are moving away from the outside the town stores, and they're moving more towards the town center. Now that brings a interesting question: When you have a small store in a town center, how do you increase in-store discovery? How do you make you know somebody who comes in your store find something that they weren't expecting to find and they can't live without? You know, how, how do you make that experience? Uh, in your store right i think i think we come back to that sort of theater um we come back to the staff within the store the one thing online retail cannot do is have staff to engage in the store and, and we've gone through many years of retailers trying to reduce the cost of operations actually we're now going into um, an era of increasing the cost of the operation because that member of staff is absolutely critical to you gaining what you are looking for there gain that customer to gain that customer's relationship to gain their loyalty to gain them wanting to come into your store and buy um, and that helping hand in terms of how can I help you what can I do for you how can I you know how can we fulfill more than you ever dreamt of is something that used to happen. Then we went away from it because we all became pilot high, sell it cheap, don't have lots of staff on store, in store. And we're, we're now going back to people realizing that actually that relationship is all important and, and people need to feel wanted. Um, because otherwise, why would you go into a store if, you, if you're not getting that experience, then you may as well do it online where you, you can probably have bigger choice. Um, you, you need someone who's going to be able to add that experience for you. So we come back to very much the same sort of thing. But I think, again, it's going to change the retail dynamic in terms of how people are viewed. Now, the other thing in, in retail is for many years now, retail associates, retail uh, people who work in retail have been seen a very low value, um, almost expendable. We right. know they're not going to stay there. They're, they're probably people between college and uh, work who mm -hmm. maybe are, are coming in, they're transitory, they're not going to work there forever because it's not seen as a valued occupation. Um, that wasn't the case years ago. It's not going to be the case going forward. And, and that training and valuing people and keeping staff is, again, going to become more of, of something that I think retailers have got to buy into and really understand that if they've got really top quality staff, then they will have a much better retention rate of customers. Now, we have seen, you know, we've seen people doing that, particularly in the electronics industry. Um, where now Best Buy went through it over here, Dixon's Curry's um, did exactly the same. They put took a lot of their marketing money and put it into training of staff because they realized that the staff experience or the, the customer experience right. of meeting knowledgeable staff was way more important um, than it was just actually doing some of that marketing activity. Um, and that's becoming more and more important. We come back to the department stores. Harrods have a lot of staff. They're not transitory. They've been there for years right. and they are very much customer centric staff. Mm. They get to know their customers. They get to know them intimately and they, they know what they want. They know what they bought in the past. They, and that therefore really enhances that. Now, you can't do that in every store. Let's, you know, being realistic, that can't happen. But what you can do is move a massive shift from where a lot of still staff are today, which is, I don't really care, I'm only here to take money or I'm only here to right. fill the shelf, to someone who is genuinely there to help and, and make it a better experience for the customer. 
And so that, again, is, is another shift that I think we're going to see coming over the next few years. Yeah, it's really shifting attitudes because we're seeing with the younger generation a more curation of the products that they buy. They don't go and get a cheap spatula. They want a spatula that was created by one of the top chefs that they'll keep for the rest of their lives and pass down you know, to their dogs. Absolutely. But, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, people don't want masses of stuff now, do they? I mean, the and and, and again, the, the the whole change in terms of how people are viewing the ecology and the world in terms of be, moving away from being a disposable world. Um, and I think valuing things far more. I'd rather have fewer of really good, really valued items than just a massive stuff that fills a house. Um, and you're absolutely right. I think the the new generation is looking at that. They they research things more. They understand things more, partly because they can, right. um, but also everything's partly, available online. Yeah, it is. Um, and but also partly because they want to know that because they they do want to be more selective. They want to be very much more discerning in where they are spending their um, their income. Um, and I, I think that that is going to happen more. Uh, it's certainly already a big trend, as you say. Um, and, you know, I think more and more people are moving away from stuff. Uh, Greta Thunberg has been traveling the world as a 16 year old girl, actually just educating all of us in the fact that she would like to have a world there in another 50, 100 years time. I think it's making everybody think. Um, and the more people are thinking about it, the more they are becoming discerning, more and more discerning consumers. Um, Do you think that the single-use plastic and the, the uh, reduction of that kind of packaging and merchandising is going to affect the supply chain uh, as it moves forward? Yeah, I mean, it's putting a lot more pressure on the supply chain right. um, because the you know, packaging was there for a very good reason, which was to protect most of it and, and make it easier for a supply chain. So the supply chain may actually have to add cost into the supply chain to make it more acceptable in store, yes. Um, and I think you know, supply chains are having to look at that. They're having to look at how they're moving product. They're having to look at um, how, what are the control methods that they have, um, both in from the manufacturing into warehouse, from warehouse into the store, and then in store. Um, more and more, we're moving back towards paper bags rather than everything being pre-packed. Uh, fantastic thing, um, but again, it, it does put a huge onus back on really very, very tight control within the supply chain and in the retailer. The, the retail management has to be so much better um, because I, I guess to an extent we've become dumb, fat, happy and lazy in terms of how we've handled things. Right. Um, you know, it, it was all too easy, wasn't it? We, we had everything just presented in a way that looked perfect. Um, that's, that's not necessarily going to be the case. Now, you know, what does that do in terms of cost? Yeah, it may, it may actually add some cost in the supply chain, but ultimately, probably, it will change the cost base at the, at the retail end because you're, you're having to handle them in a different way. Um, so overall, then... You know, the cost will shift up and down the supply chain, but ultimately they will make them efficient again. That's that's what supply chain people are about. They will make them efficient. What will become more difficult, and I think what is a real challenge for some of the um, online retailers is how you put that through a supply chain that you don't own and control as tightly. Uh, and that is going to be a real challenge. Because packaging at the moment, now if you if you look at everything you get from Amazon, it has got so much packaging around it. Um, it most of that is going to have to change. It's it's got to go. We're becoming more conscious of that. Um, so how are they going to control that in an area where they don't control the supply chain? And that that is a a real challenge. Um, it's one that I don't doubt the um, supply chain people will will find ways around it. Um, but it is going to mean that 
maybe we're all going to have to pay a bit more. Uh, in fact, we're almost undoubtedly going to have to pay a bit more. Um, but we're also going to have much more tightly controlled ways of, of handling things. And, uh, you know, the, the old way of just throw it onto the back of a van is not going to work going forward. And so for the new year, for 2020, what do you see as the biggest changes that are coming down the pipe? Um, what to can me, we expect? Yeah. yeah, I think the the whole thing of online and retail, all retail, getting closer to their customers, understanding the customer a lot more, understanding what they're what they are looking for, what they're wanting, how they are thinking. Um, because you talked about social media earlier. Social media just speeds up everything. The, the speed of um, the whole of the Greta Thunberg change has been unbelievable. I mean, I think everybody's probably seen her on her yacht going back over the Atlantic and back. Um, you know, that's become a, a huge theme. Um, and, and that sort of thing just speeds everything up. So I think retailers have got to be much faster to react they have got now, as we talked about earlier, the ability with AI to understand um, all that stuff and all the data that, that, that they had to be able to react faster. Um, so there's a massive amount there of more thinking retailers, people who um, aren't just traders anymore, but they are genuinely becoming more analytical in how they look at their retail space and how they use their retail space. Um, and how they therefore try and create and, and maintain that relationship with their customer base. And I think that closing of, we, we've talked a long time about customer centricity and people becoming yeah. more and more customer centric. Um, customer is king has been something we've talked about for a long time, but it's just accelerated way, way beyond anything I think any of us could ever dream of. And I, think, I think that is certainly taking shape. Um, this battle between brands and retail and online um, and where they're going, I think is, is going to continue. And I think we, we will see more online retailers coming on the high street. Um, fortunately, I think at last we can start to really silence the naysayers who said retail's dead and the high street's dying and everything else. Because I genuinely have never believed that to be the case. Retail's always evolved. Um, people said retail was dying when all the hypermarkets opened and it's right. now coming back. Um, it's not going to change. We will just find more uh, different retailers coming online, specialist, very focused retailers. And they, they may not be there for very long. They, they may come in. They may have a relatively short life, pop-up stores or whatever they be. They, they may come very fast, hit the market very fast and then move out because Trends will change faster and faster as we go forward, um, and specialists will start to come back. Uh, and I think the big hypermarkets, the Walmarts, killed a lot of specialist retailers. Specialist, spe specialist retailers will start to reemerge. People will start to come back, and, and they want to know that they're getting the very best they possibly can. Um, and that comes from specialists, generally. And yeah, I think I think that's a perfect place to end. You know, customer is king. Specialists are coming back. That's going to be the future. <laughs> Absolutely.